regulators, and we've heard bunches about different technology, but what we haven't heard was the voice of the communities that are potentially impacted by some of these. When we were putting together this program, we wanted to end up with folks that have had experience of some of these processes and regulations being applied in their communities, and we thought this would be especially useful for the folks in Silverton who were concerned about the potential um, that Superfund listing um, may still be someplace out in the future, even though we hear that it's not on the fast track. It is a source of funding. I think educating the community about how CERCLA and Superfund has worked live on the ground and hearing from community members, not from regulators and bureaucrats. So that's the focus of this next session. Um, we're hoping that um, the after the presentation, we actually, we actually do have time for questions um, and interaction with the audience. So I think I will start this off by introducing Alan Kopp, who, um, I'm not going to read the whole bio, I think you are the boss of the wonderful helping folks in the Red Police, and one part of your bio talks about being a river hero. So with that, I'm going to hand it on to you. <laughs> my introduction already um, slightly in error because I really am a bureaucrat. I'm even the federal bureaucrat. Um, but if you look at my resume, it looks more like a group show at an art gallery. Um, I've worked in historic preservation, a lot of community work involved with that. I left that and went to the private sector, worked as a developer of historic properties. And if you're ever going to develop anything like a historic property in any kind of a small community, most of them were mining communities, you are going to be deeply involved with that community or you'll never get your project done. Um, I went from there to working in heritage areas, basically economic development projects that are small, independent federal agencies trying to sort of create an economy um, based on heritage. And from there to my current position at the Office of Surface Mining, where I was um, smart enough to invent uh, first, the Appalachian Coal Country team of uh, VISTA positions, which are the domestic equivalent of the Peace Corps. Um, I now have almost 30 VISTA positions working across the Appalachian Coal Country in individual communities, working with little watershed groups and other community improvement groups uh, to kind of clean up the mess left from old coal. Um, thanks to Loretta Panetta, um, my boss got a request for uh, wondering why they couldn't have a team like that in Colorado. Um, I was, of course, cheery behind Loretta's back. So um, in 2006, we started work on a Colorado VISTA team. And today we have 20-plus uh, VISTAs working in Colorado and another five in New Mexico. Uh, and that team is likely to double within a year. So. These orange shirts that you see are all college graduates. Some of them have a master's degree. They have committed a year of their professional careers to working at a very low. They have a small stipend that enables them to be a full-time volunteer in their community. And that kind of commitment is one I cherish and have great respect for as well. So thanks, Dave. We've been here for three days for our spring training, so we had a great opportunity to be in Silverton and then hooked into the mining conference about half of us managed to stay here. So that's been really nice. But just a couple of quick perspectives for me. One of the first um, lectures that the visitors get is usually entitled Feed the Bear. And it's basically the short lesson that if you just give the bureaucracy what it wants, in the form that it wants, on the deadlines that it wants, it will probably be rather satisfied and leave you alone. I've made a whole career out of feeding the bear and then getting away with all kinds of stuff. But if you don't feed the bear, the bear gets hungry and then it bites you. Um, so one of the real lessons in any kind of this environmental work is feed the bear first. And if you're good at feeding the bear, then you can make the bear dance. You know, you build a relationship with that, with that regulator, with that agency. They sort of appreciate the work that you have done for them. Your work is making them look good. Um, I actually, one of the little trophies I have at home is a Phoenix Award for 
a project that I did when I was running a little nonprofit uh, for, and it is the first mine scarred land ever, you know, Brownfields project ever awarded the Phoenix Award. And we weren't even formally an EPA Brownfields project. Uh, but we brought 35 acres of land, built an acid mine drainage treatment system, turned the water from that into new wetlands that were mitigation wetlands for the highway department, and created an active recreation area. It's called AMD and R. You can find it on Google. Um, <clears throat> but doing that taught me a lot about the utility of feeding the thing and the, 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 the opportunity to take not only good science, which we had to have if we were going to do you know, effective acid mine drainage remediation. But what I learned is that that good science is absolutely necessary, but in community-driven projects, it may not be sufficient. There are other disciplines, the arts, the humanities, historic preservation, all those kinds of perspectives that can also be brought into these reclamation projects to make them much more community-driven, much more broadly community-supported. If it's not just pure science going out there doing something that people don't even understand, they don't even know what the words mean, um, but it's actually something that they can understand, that they can embrace because there's this cool interpretive trail right next to it, or there's something else going on that sort of opens up other windows, other perspectives, then you can start to get the community buy-in that will drive these projects forward. I also have to add, um, I'm trying to be sort of context for three real projects, but I also have to add that I'm from the land of SMAC. All right, that's the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. That's the act that says, if you want to try and fix this water, and you can just make it better, that's good enough. That's driven, in the Appalachian coal country, that's driven little watershed groups to build acid mine drainage treatment systems and do all kinds of other stuff on their own. You know, in the West, I find it, I think the Westerner by birth, but it's almost amusing that this sort of land of the free is so insistent on, you know, the 1872 mining law is all we need, and we'll just deal with clean air and clean water and all that other stuff. That the resulting system in the West is heavily federal, agency-driven. Citizens can't really get involved because they'll end up being liable. So when you start talking about good Sam, Talk to some watershed groups and other leaders in the Appalachian coal country where Good Sam is part of this macro bill, essentially. You know, they didn't go Good Samaritan's work when they wrote the 77 bill, but you can really get involved and not be liable. And that really opens up community engagement um, in many, many very important ways. So I think with, with those two things as a context, the only last thing I, I'd want to add is that when you start looking at any kind of big reclamation project, especially when it's driven by larger or sort of regulatory drives, it's really a choice. You can either kind of stick your head in the sand and they'll just roll right over you. Uh, you can fight like crazy, you know, without really knowing what you're fighting about, just object. And they'll just sort of, it's almost a war of attrition at that point, and they'll wear you out because they get bureaucrats replacing bureaucrats replacing bureaucrats until you're all dead and they win. Or you can say, this could be an opportunity. There's a bunch of money on the table. There's a bunch of expertise that's available to us if we like shape that expertise. And if you want to see good examples of that, look at the Anonymous River stakeholders. Talk to Bev Rich, the sort of queen of making historic preservation stuff happen from more diverse resources than you could imagine. Um, and even look, if you will, at the ANDNR website where you can find the text for every grant we got. We got 40 different grants, none of them were from the traditional sources for acid mine drainage remediation because we opened up other perspectives, made other things possible. And with that, we have three great projects that are specific examples of just how that all has happened, and I'm going to let it go from there. So, my name is Anthony Lopone, I'm the Director for the Cool Creek Watershed Coalition in Preston, New Colorado, and I've been with them since uh, 2006, the organization has been around since 2003. Uh, we do have two FISN members, where are they? 
there's one, there's two, Crystal and Zach, uh, and they should be applauding very loudly at the end of this presentation. <laughs> <laughs> I did pick up today's uh, Silverton Standard and saw on the cover there the EPA dropped Superfund bid, so with that I'd like to concede the rest of my time to the rest of the panelists. <laughs> Just kidding, I think this is getting warmed up. So, uh, let's go to the next slide. So just a quick overview of uh, what, what we're going to talk about today. I just want to give you a, a quick overview of, of the reclamation process of the remediation process that's been going on. Talk to you about the pros and cons of Superfund designation and impaired water quality. Believe it, uh, believe it or not, there are maybe some pros to impaired water quality. Um, and then community feedback on the stigma of Superfund designation uh, in a west slope towards the economy. So this is a map of the Crested Butte and uh, Standard Mine area. Chris, we'd off to the right, and then as the crow flies 3.6 miles up to the standard mine, um, it may be really different from, from what your Superfund site may look like, which I don't have that whole uh, bit of context. But this is Kepler Pass Road. It's a, a seasonal road that's open, and this is Cold Creek that flows along it, and then Elk Creek that drains into Cold Creek. Uh, Kepler Pass Road is used pretty heavily in the summer. It's a winter recreation trailhead, so there's a lot of snowmobiles use up there. And then you can see that there's the Mount Emmons Water Treatment Plant and then some far service roads that get up to the standard mine. And so it's really a fairly inaccessible spot. Uh, you'd have to get permission to go through the Mount Emmons uh, area, which is owned by US Energy, or travel up a really steep double track road to get there. Um, and, and so it's, um, it's off the beaten path for most people, which is maybe pretty helpful for a supermarket site. So this is a shot of Elk Avenue, which is the main street in Crested Butte, and it was a former mining town. Uh, with a, a lot of coal mining and some hard rock mining as well, landed both bituminous and anthracite coal. And now it's transitioned over to having a, a summer, a real strong summer and winter um, tourist economy. And maybe, well, maybe this winter's tourist economy wasn't that strong because of the snow, but uh, it's actually starting to really pick up in the summers. So we do have a lot of visitors coming in for uh, wildflower festivals and all sorts of great stuff. And so just a quick timeline so you have a, some context. Again, I came in in 2006. Um, I was really fortunate to kind of come in right as all this stuff was ramping up. So I've been invested in, uh, in this in, since almost the beginning. Uh, so it was on the national priorities list in 2005. Um, and uh, that was with, and I'll talk about this later, but with the community's blessing. Um, and so they did come to us and we did invite them into our community. At least we feel like we did. Uh, we did get a technical assistance grant, I'll talk about that in a minute, and that was one of my first positions with uh, the organization. And then in 2007 and 2008, one of the things that they did was to do some uh, emergency removal actions up, up at the site that dealt with mostly the waste rock and tailing something. And then uh, during that whole process, they, can, they were collecting a lot of data for the remedial investigation feasibility study, really great if you're having a hard time sleeping. And then they released the proposed plan in 2010, which is based on that, which uh, basically comes out with the preferred alternatives, which we, we are agreeing with. Uh, record of decision was signed uh, September 30, 2011, and that's kind of the legal document that gets us going to the next steps, where EPA has to basically go back internally for funding um, to, to complete the project. And then they'll do some phase one implementation, hopefully, in the summer of 2013, and I'll tell you what that means in a minute. So I'm not going to read all that, but the technical assistance grant is basically there for communities like yours and or in our case like ours to hide, hire technical experts to provide oversight of the EPA process. Uh, it comes in $50,000 at a time and uh, it's a renewable thing. So if your process takes long and you run out of money, there's more money there for you than just that one bit. And we use that money to hire two folks. Uh, Dr. Joseph Ryan is one of our um, technical advisors and though it says he's um, in engineering, he has some background in toxicology. So he really helped with the human health, ecological toxicology piece. The toxicology piece. And then Brent Armstrong, um, uh, Brent Scarborough, sorry about that Brent, uh, with Frontier Environmental Services uh, is an engineer that kind of looks at the engineering design on, uh, on this project. So he can say this is going to collapse if they do it or not. Um, next. So this is a shot of the standard mine. There's a few of them here that kind of show some of the waste rock piles that we have. Um, this is an area where uh, a trestle came across and or been, and all, this, all these structures came down. And you can't really see it very well because of all the obstructions here, but the, the main draining attic for this mine is back there, that's at level one, and you can see the water kind of sheet flowing across. This is Elk Creek, and then one more. And then Elk Creek, the one I just showed you, we're behind all this down here, and Elk Creek rolls down from the left uh, of this picture. 
runs through all that waste rock and then runs into this lovely tailings pond, which was an unengineered structure that had a breach in it. It would flow in, mix, or you'd basically be on top of the tailings and then run through a breach into Elk Creek, which flowed into Coal Creek, which is the town of Crystal Beach drinking water supply. One of the things that we were told that really kind of drove the um, a high score for the Superfund um, listing was the fact that this unengineered tailings pond, well, it's just that it was unengineered, it could have failed at any time and it would have uh, basically compromised the drinking water supply. So the tailings pond, um, through a removal action, the tailings pond and all the waste rock was removed um, and placed in a repository offsite and capped and revegetated. And then there were some studies done by uh, folks from the Division of Reclamation, Mining, and Safety that foolishly went into the mine uh, to look at where water was coming in contact with uh, mineralized deposits. And so this is the uh, level one that we knew about. And we know that water quality up here is, is relatively decent, but that somewhere between here and here it gets really hammered. And so we were trying to understand where that happens, and that's going to play into uh, the proposed plan that I'll talk in a bit. One of the other things that they did, they did was uh, the site's at 11,000 feet, so they wanted to see if a, a sulfate-reducing bioreactor, basically a passive wetland, would work um, at that high elevation. So this is a little testing shed, and that's this small pilot-scale bioreactor. And then just wanted to show you really quickly some results from the reclamation. Uh, so this is that third shot where the tailings pond was down here before you were in that valley. And the tailings pond is gone, they've recreated some wetlands, realigned Elk Creek's channel, and revegetated uh, the site. It's uh, looking pretty good. And the revegetation has been successful so far, which is a couple spot areas that need some treatment. A couple before and after is just for uh, some context on water quality. This is just the waste rock and tailings. Uh, these are the two standards, chronic and acute. Uh, this is Cold Creek upstream of the standard mine. That's Elk Creek that used to flow through the mine uh, workings and then downstream over there. You can see where we were before, exceedances of the standard. And this is for zinc, the previous one was for cadmium, and then you can see before and after. So this is before and this is after. So you're seeing a pretty dramatic, dramatic increase to the point where um, for zinc we're getting achievement of the two water quality centers there, which is a really great thing. Next one. So the next one is really dealing with that flowing water. And they're going to do a few things where they're going to pump in some flowable fill, basically a flowable concrete, into those levels up top and try to get that water to go around the mine workings instead of through them and hopefully it will go out somewhere else and stay clean um, and hopefully it will reduce the amount that comes down. We'll have a flow through bulkhead at the bottom and that kind of plays in a lot to phase two. Um, but then they're going to do some uh, revegetation and some institutional controls, basically trying to keep people off of the site so it doesn't get disturbed. Um, and then what they'll do after that is see how, how that uh, helped cheat, what, what they did for water quality through some monitoring and then if necessary, there'll be some triggers that will determine uh, if we need to continue with the passive treatment system there, and they would have to expand the footprint and make it larger because they're only treating a very small amount of the water that comes out of the mine. So, um, you know, one of the things that was really good for us was super fun. How am I doing on time? You have five minutes. Five more minutes, sorry. So, one of the things that's uh, been sort of a positive for us with the super fun site is um, that there wasn't for our organization, it's been a little hard to have a rallying cry uh, for clean water, even though some people really do appreciate that. But Superfund was something that, that people could say, oh, this site is significant. There's really something that needs to be done with this. And, um, and so it led to um, what started out as a planning effort by our organization. We basically recognized that we couldn't clean up that site with the amount of money that we would have available to us voluntarily. I might say now that we have a lot more capacity in the organization that maybe we could have taken that on now, but um, back in those days it was way too much for us to bite off, and so bringing EPA in made a lot of sense. Um, they've covered a ton of water quality um, samples for us, which have been used in the TMDL process since we do have an impaired stream. It's been used for standard setting, and it's also been used for, by our organization for our watershed planning. Um, one of the other things that's, you know, for us, if, if your water quality is going to be impaired, well, it might as well be impaired, you might as well be a high priority watershed because that looks really good in the grant application. So that's helped us get money so that we can actually address some of these things. And, you know, that buy-in that I talked about, having a Superfund site kind of creates um, this sense of urgency. If it's good enough for Superfund, then it means it's bad enough for your community to do something about it. And then it also uh, was a great thing for us to talk about connecting people back to the drinking water supply. Most people turn on their water and it comes out of the spout and that's where their water comes from and they have no idea the Coal Creek is a drinking water supply, so it connects them back to this resource. And it's really been nice to uh, increasing our technical capacity in the community. 
we've learned a lot through this uh, mining reclamation process, and it's helped us um, if we look into doing some of our own mining claims in the future. And it also led to what I think is one of the finest watershed groups in the state of Colorado, if not the entire universe, uh, the Coal Creek Watershed Coalition, whose director is known for his humility. <laughs> Next slide. So that's our mission. We're basically there to protect and restore the watershed. And um, I, one more slide. And I just wanted to show you where, what we did. When I first started in 2006, we had a standard mine on our plate, and we were figuring out what was going on there. And we were doing our own water quality monitoring. And here we are, about six and a half years later, and we're involved in all these different things now on our watersheds. And we're actually working now, not just the Coke Creek watershed, but we've moved over to, where's my little thing say? Somewhere up here says so Slate River, right there. Slate River, so we've moved over into an adjacent watershed and been working on that. And that kind of came at the spurring of uh, Division of Reclamation, Mining and Safety and BLM and wanted partners to be helping them over in that watershed. So it's been a really great thing for, for us and for them. Thanks. And so um, one of the other things I tried to do, and this is by no way um, any sort of a formal survey, but I just tried to talk to some of the folks in our community um, about what Superfund meant when it was coming in. Um, and was it something that was really alarming for us? Um, the general overview is no, I'll tell you that now, just because um, I think I might run out of time before I get through all of these, but um, High Country Citizens Alliance, which is one of the other environmental groups whose um, water program director, outgoing, is the president of our organization, so that initially the town staff was opposed to this because of some issues in Park City. Um, they really felt, and, and I couldn't figure out what exactly those were. I did call some folks that were out in Park City, and they were uh, they've been disappeared since that project. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get an answer on that. Uh, but the former mayor and the town council basically said, "This is a problem. We have a solution potentially in front of us, and we should deal with this problem." And they looked at it as a positive. So we basically invited the EPA into our community with conditions. We asked for them to commit to transparency and community involvement. And I, we really had that. I would say, by and large, our relationship with EPA has been very strong and very positive. Um, I'm going to talk about maybe some future concerns with dealing with them, but so far they've done pretty much everything we've asked. The preferred alternative that I showed you before is something that our advisors and our organization overall uh, really is supportive of. We think that's a great solution they've proposed. Next slide. So um, I had talked to the Gunnison Crestview Tourism Director, I just, again, trying to talk to some people that might be in the know. She knew that we had a super fun site up there. She called this a public, she called it a public relations opportunity. You can talk about all the negatives of super fun and all the <coughs> means and hazardous waste in your backyard. Or you can say these things exist and we're going to do something about it. And that was her spin on it. Well, she asked me not to use the word spin. Um, <laughs> but she didn't have any information formally or informally on the impacts of having super fun designation in the backyard. I talked to the Mount Crestview Chamber of Commerce. I talked to the former president. She, again, also knew that there was a site up there, but she didn't really know if it was having any detriment to the community. And then I talked to a board member who's also a restaurant owner who was aware that it was a super fun site, and he said he's never heard anything one way or the other. So I, I know that's not entirely conclusive, but that's the best I could come up with in a couple days worth of research. Um, and then I talked to the Crestview Community Development Director. He's very involved with the organization, um, and again, he saw it as a positive. Um, he hasn't really heard anything uh, them showing any sort of um, negative effect. And then, you know, really the issue was that if we didn't bring EPA in at the time, we really felt like we weren't going to get it done because of the price tag. Now, the price tag might be a lot more inflated because of the EPA's involvement and all the rigor that they have to go through, but at least the project's getting done. And then the Red Lady Coalition, who's uh, an environmental group, we have a proposal, um, well, not a proposal, but there's a company, U.S. Energy, that's interested in developing a molybdenum mine in the Coal Creek uh, watershed. There's an organization out there uh, trying to look at the socioeconomic impacts, and I think that ties into some of the things that were mentioned before. Um, they basically are coming, though, from the uh, background you can see in this mission that they want to leave the mountain intact, so you can see wh which way they lean on that. But they're looking to try to prove, in a very defensible way, with a socioeconomic impact study, uh, what the influence would be on an existing tourism economy. They're looking at four different things. And I was looking to see if any of these had some relevance to maybe thinking about a Superfund site. And the only one that I could really see that would be maybe of interest is what happens when you have a mine that's in between active operations, not fully reclaimed yet, um, with some mine scarred lands up there that could go back into operation. And, and could there be a parallel there between how that would have, um, have affected the community with another, um, with a, a Superfund site? I think I'm almost done. Uh, so a couple of things that, you know, I told you that our relationship with the EPA is really good. 
Um, and I did ask them for a donation to the organization to tell them how great it was. I tell you all how great, and they refused to make a donation. But um, but I will tell you that it's been really good. Now we um, one of the things that's really interesting, and this is my concern for the future, is that the federal government is maybe not equal to flexible especially the EPA, when it comes down to them having to do things based on their regulatory framework. We may say, can you please do X? And they might have to say, there's no way I can ever get that through. So they have limitations on their own. End. The phase two trigger, where we go um, to determining if we need that passive wetland treatment system, we haven't even talked about what that looks like yet. So they may say water quality needs to be really, really, really bad before we determine that. And we may say, no, it doesn't work for us. We want it to be put in, even if you're just barely not achieving standards. And then there's some issues up there with um, if they expand that bioreactor, that passive treatment system, it would fall on Forest Service lands. The Forest Service is not really excited about having a bioreactor on their uh, property, the, the liability there that would come with it. And then we've got to figure out some things with the environmental covenants, operations, and maintenance of the facility. Because once the Superfund site is completely done and checked off, let's stop it. Big red letters, wow. Um, <laughs> high but anyway, when the operations and maintenance all falls in the state of Colorado, and I don't know if you pay much attention to the economy in the state of Colorado right now, but the state is not necessarily what we would call flush with money. So they're not excited about taking on an expensive project that might have, um, that might have some significant dollars that they'd be um, touched on. And I've already talked on this. One more slide on that. So um, if you have more questions, just let me know. And of course, when I talked to the tourism director, she almost required that I put in GenesisCrestonView.com so that if you ever want to come see our sites and stay in our lovely hotels and our restaurants, we'd love to have you. Creed was a mining town with some ebbs and flows, 
uh, until uh, 1985. So almost 100 years of mining. Now, one of the things that allowed Cree to continue mining into recent times was a recent find in 1965 uh, up on the Bachelor uh, Mountain, and that was the Bulldog Formation, and uh, that find was sold to Homestake, and that became the Bulldog Mine. And the reason I want to bring that up to you is it, it ties everything together with what we're talking about, with circular and regulation and everything like that. Homestake was developing that mine in the, in the late 1960s and uh, was moving forward. It was a very rich find. In the Puzzle Vault, uh, they were finding silver in the 2200 ounce per ton values, which is, you know, that's economic by any standards. <laughs> and, uh, and so anyway, uh, the Clean Water Act came along was passed in 72 and enacted in 73. So Homestake had this mine and they had new regulations that they had to bring the mine into compliance with, which they did very quickly. Uh, they had to, of, of course, build a new water treatment plant. Uh, they built a new tailings pond and, and in the late 70s, they ended up building a new mill as well. But they operated for 20 years in compliance with uh, the earth not 20 years, they operated for 15 years in compliance with the Clean Water Act. And when they closed in 85 and began their reclamation work in the 90s, uh, they did reclaim the mine, they closed the mine, went through their mine closure under the close supervision of what we used to call, uh, uh, well it's now the Division of Reclamation and Mine Safety, but it used to be DMG. And uh, uh, so they closed that in compliance. They did not have a draining at it. They did not have any violations for water quality uh, or, or any orders against them. And so I would present that as evidence that the Clean Water Act is working. And, and then I would contrast that with the problems that we're working with in the Creed Mining District that essentially come from the 1890s and to a lesser extent after that. Um, the turning point was about 1906. We had some legislation and then there was a, uh, there was a lawsuit um, and they found in favor of the plaintiff and the judge awarded a private property owner about $1,700 and ordered Creed Mines to stop uh, disposing of their mill tails in Willow Creek. So things kind of turned the corner after that. Uh, bringing, bringing us up then to more recent times, uh, the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee got formed. Uh, we really had to work pretty hard to make a case for our ability to effectively handle the problems in Willow Creek. And it took a couple of years to do that. But Eventually, uh, two of the Region 8 supervisors, Barry Levine and Dale Wodenall, I don't know if any of you guys remember those names, uh, they're from a while back. Anyway, they came to town, looked at our project, looked at the Creed Mining District, and kind of off the record said, okay, as long as you guys are making progress, we will not proceed uh, with listing. You won't be on any of our lists. Uh, and, of course, he's referring to the national priorities list. And so that, that gave us the go-ahead to begin to acquire some funding. And, and it gave us some credibility. And uh, it gave us a green light to move forward with our reclamation activities in Willow Creek. Um, and then we proceeded. We did about three years worth of characterization. It was strongly recommended to us that before we started doing any cleanup, we needed to do a thorough and competent job of evaluating the watershed, which we did, and started cleaning things up. And then some things happened. Um, there, was a, uh, there was a lawsuit uh, by the Wasson Ranch. Now, the Wasson Ranch is kind of a, a guest ranch. It's owned by second generation owners from Dallas, most of whom are attorneys. 
And, uh, and they weren't satisfied with the progress that the uh, Willow Creek Reclamation Committee was making, even though we completed basin-wide characterization in three years. And in the fourth year, we're actually cleaning things up, which, you know, everybody seemed to be pretty satisfied with. But they used the citizen-initiated suit provision of the Clean Water Act, and they also evoked RICRA, RICRA which I never understood. But um, uh, they filed this suit, uh, you know, asking the EPA to uphold its regulatory responsibility and make, make the Superfund site do something about the bad water. And, um, and that created some real problems for us because with the uncertainty in the district, it made it very difficult for the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee to acquire grants, uh, you know, to compete effectively because there is a lot of competition for grants in this industry. And because of the uncertainty uh, developed by that lawsuit, um, we were not getting any grants. And uh, CDPHE was kind of going, Me, you know, this is a little scary. And, um, and so that lawsuit went on. Uh, at about that same point in time, there was a cribbing failure. Uh, a grizzly plugged up, up by the Commodore mine, and there was a cribbing failure. Water backed up and overtopped, and so there was a an event, uh, kind of a catastrophic, catastrophic event up there. One of those things that was on our uh, to-do list, if you will, and uh, the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee was fully willing to take on that Commodore mine complex, every aspect of it, both the draining at it. We hadn't done so yet because we were waiting for Good Samaritan legislation. Another one of those days of food things. Um, which we still haven't got. And so that's, that's why we hadn't engaged in that battle. Um, and so as a result of that, um, the EPA came to us and said, you might consider uh, you might consider putting this on the national priorities list, and um, and so we talked about it. We opened it up to the community. Well, the first thing that, that came up in our conversations was the policy of the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee, which was never never to call for regulatory enforcement and never to engage in uh, litigation, never to engage in a lawsuit. And the reason that we have those two policies is so that we can encourage the broadest participation possible from the stakeholders. And, and those two things are very important to certain stakeholders. And we have participation by those stakeholders. So, so we were a true stakeholder group um, with just about every aspect of ownership, involvement, and uh, interest incorporated into our stakeholder base. Um, that created a little bit of a problem, but we went forward anyway. And so we asked the community, well, what are your concerns about Superfund? And everybody knows what they are. In for a penny, in for a pound. Uh, Superfund sites have a tendency to get bigger instead of smaller. Uh, 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 you lose community control to a certain extent. And of course, the huge fear, and that is the uncertainty of how people will fare in uh, the potentially responsible party uh, operation, which you heard about earlier in CERCLA, you know, the several lean and joint thing. Um, also, um, the EPA, uh, their funding was uncertain. So the community wanted some assurances that the EPA would have the resources to do the job, that they would do the job uh, in a reasonable amount of time, and uh, and then some lesser concerns. But we identified all the concerns and uh, reported to the city and Menno County and said, these are the concerns, but given the absence of Good Samaritan legislation and uh, the pending lawsuit, uh, we really can't wait any longer. Somebody needs to be doing something about the Nelson Tunnel quickly. And so while the Willow Creek Reclamation Committee can't get involved in it, we won't oppose the, we won't oppose the process 
if the city and county wants to move forward with it. And, uh, and so we helped them craft a letter to the governor. And Governor Ritter was very courageous. He was also very thorough. Uh, I know he consulted with his uh, chief policy analyst and his legal staff and, uh, and uh, Division of Reclamation and Mine Safety and CDPHE and eventually came out with a letter and uh, requesting uh, that the EPA look into listing the Nelson Tunnel. And he, con and he included in his letter all of Creed's concerns except one. And the only reason he didn't include that is because it's not legal. CERCLA is very, very clear about how you proceed with identifying and pursuing potentially responsible parties. And so he left that concern out. <laughs> and he had to. Um, and then the rest of the story is that um, given that letter, the EPA came in and uh, it was a very public process. Uh, they did a great job of involving the community, soliciting community input, being very transparent. Uh, and uh, we got a listing. The Nelson Tunnel was listed on the national priorities list. Uh, at the same time, they were mobilizing an emergency response to deal with the uh, to deal with that cribbing failure and that catastrophic event, uh, and uh, and they did a very good job of that. There was really no impact uh, to tourism or the economy. They were very sensitive to the golden 100 days in Crete, which you know about here in Silverton as well, and. Uh, it went very well. They did everything that they said they were going to do, and I would have to say, when they say we're not that way anymore, they're not.
or modern history, we were designated a Superfund study area. Oh, we fought that. But in fact, it went through and uh, it turned out uh, to be a godsend because we now came under CERCLA and CERCLA being the dominant law to uh, uh, the Clean Water Act. Uh, and CERCLA having uh, certain things that uh, they could designate somebody as a good Samaritan. So uh, we went down through here, uh, the same stuff that people have talked about, uh, forming various stakeholder groups and so on. Uh, we opened a watershed exhibit in Idaho Springs. Uh, we had an advisory group and so on, and, and down in the uh, formed the Clear Creek Watershed Foundation, incorporated as a 501c3 not-for-profit with an original focus on mine re remediation and a focus on water. That's important. If you want to be credible, you better be an entity. If you're not legal as an entity, you're playing games with yourself. Next slide, please. <laughs> public hearing, stakeholders forum, public feedback, dare to do good things, and we had a, a action memo. From Mike Holmes. Mike and I wrote it, and his boss signed it, and it became national policy eventually and uh, a good Samaritan, in that, that little license to steal that I got from Mike, uh, are good Samaritan, good Samaritan, good Samaritan, spelled out throughout that. But there were many partners uh, involved, and part of that responsibility was we had to hold public hearing. He had no process for a public hearing. So the county commissioners agreed that they would hold the public hearings, uh, we would show what we were had uh, done the year before, what we're planning to do, and the crutch was uh, we want to have a excavation permit. But people showed up at those hearings, and in all of those hearings that we have had over the years have been no negative comments. Property owners who had things fixed on their property, came in and applauded the efforts. And uh, that has gone on. We've had no losses. Uh, with those many partners, and we keep our cash flow under $100,000, we're not a target for losses. And if we're doing good, and we have a public hearing, some third party from Australia wants to see if they can make a dime off of it and comes here, he goes before the judge and the judge says, hey, they spelled out everything they were going to do in that public hearing. Where were you? It really doesn't have a leg to stand on and so, next slide. We started out and we figured we're going to eat this bear a bite at a time, staying away from the pony ends because there were lots of pony ends out there. And so what we nibbled on, first project was a McClellan cleanup. It was a mill site right on, uh, right at Dumont, right on the creek. Uh, and we said we're going to turn everything, when we're turning dirt, we're going to produce something that has a useful for future. So I got credit uh, for creating a boat launch facility at about uh, 10, 000, no, uh, 8,500 feet at Dumont. And it launched really the rafting industry because they had a place to put in. We are now getting about $15 million annual impact out of that. Puts Clear Creek, this little creek that's just outside of, of uh, Denver. Uh, number three in the state. Street, stream habitat improvement, that produces gold metal fishing. That's another 
a good thing. And of course, there's a hiking, biking, and other opportunities next time. Look, at, we got big mines, and they're operating. You've talked about Henderson, and the fry quarry is a, a good quarry that produces a lot of uh, rock for the roads around and all of that, and we're sitting on I-70. Um, there's a, some things that we are looking at creatively. Uh, one is uh, we sit on the power line that runs east-west uh, through Clear Creek County. It's already in, and it is uh, one half of all the east-west power transmission to Colorado. No reason to go through the green. It already exists, and it runs into uh, Cabin Creek, which is a pump back storage facility. So there is storage for renewable energy, solar and uh, others. We also have, you know, the community gardens and all of the other stuff that you might uh, want to go for. Next slide. Look at this is a picture of the, uh, the watershed. These are the 14ers up here. And down there is Denver on the far end. And this water feeds about 350,000 people in the northern Denver suburbs through Stanley Lake. And that's the Stanley Lake cities. It also produces the best damn beer. <laughs> And uh, we're winning big trophies this year. And they cited that the reason that uh, Coors won those trophies was because of the quality of their water. Now, this is a super fun study. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it was. And in fact, it's getting there. We have on here uh, 16 segments. And only three of those segments meet water quality standards. But all of them meet great fishing standards. Up here, we've got greenback cutthroats. A little bit further down, we've got rainbows. We have uh, uh, a brook trout. And we have a huge population of reproducing browns. We have one site in there, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, <laughs> that has 900 pounds of ground trout per acre. Heck, that's almost as good as a, uh, uh, one of our fish hatcheries. So this is an arrow pointing at Denver, and there are still many segments that we have to clean up. But I'm quite happy when I go fishing. Next. Okay, here's what you need to do. And incidentally, Chris has a bunch of these slides that she can give you in, what is it, three or four to a page if you want to take those. Uh, we need to adjust to market trends because EPA, Superfund won't be around forever. And uh, really, uh, we do design build. We keep our burden rate less than 10% because we do design build and because we keep, we don't do studies. We don't waste the money on studies. We're a dare and do outfit. <laughs> don't be afraid to be visionary and entrepreneurial. Next slide. We started looking at more than water, we looked at uh, advancing uh, watershed sustainability. And it's ecology, economy, society. We're trying to move that stuff together on projects with shared resources and basic needs. The odd colors and that uh, of the uh, light blue and the tan and the, and the red, those are the best management practice areas. This is where you do best management practice. You can't solve everything but make a progress. Next. So here's the markets. We stood back and we looked and said, where can we in the future get money? Of course, our number one is 
working on uh, orphan mine sites, but there's natural resource management. We've gone to uh, Trout Unlimited and to others because of, we have some sites that you can isolate an upper uh, area and create an ecological island. Down past Henderson is a big culvert, a mile long. Fish can't make it up through there. They can come down, but up above, there's good bugs. We improve the water quality, improve the habitat up there, and now that is a uh, greenback cutthroat uh, area. You can cut, catch all four uh, species in our watershed. We talked a lot today about preservation promotion of historic mines. That's great. There's money there. Alternative energy, transportation, wind and solar, there's huge money there. You probably got good solar and you've got uh, uh, good uh, wind here. Don't be afraid of it. You've got enough nooks and crannies that you can stick that stuff in and really produce a, a, a lot. Waste stream reductions. You know what our soil is? That we put on it's sugar beet residue, which is very calcareous, very uh, good. And we use uh, composted uh, stuff that we get from the, the dead trees. We've been composting stuff for about 15 years. We need to also uh, wor worry about maintaining the subsurface rights of people. Our old miners got down to the water table maybe 100 feet below and they ran out of energy because they were using hydropower. And there wasn't much of hydropower at that time. Two billion dollars in today's money was taken out of Clear Creek County, out of this watershed. There's probably five uh, times that still below the piezometric surface which is now, now essentially at the creek level. So there is a huge value there. And the biggest bang for the buck comes from our education and outreach. Next slide, please. Look, if we have a watershed festival where all of our partners, all 40 of them, get together, we provide the tents, and they each uh, are focused on uh, kids, and what we're trying to do is make sure that generation understands their heritage and what they can do with the values of that site. Next slide, please. You know, this uh, swoosh out there, uh, we, we decided, we look back at least two years and forward five years for everything that we do. And uh, so that, and they, it's the ecology, the economics, and the society are those three P's. Or you can look at it as water, soil, or earth, and energy. All of that we have to move forward with. Thank you very much.